our event today is titled, What Does the Murder of Activist Mariano Abarca in Chiapas, Mexico Say About Canadian Government Accountability? So today we have simultaneous translation in Spanish, um, which is available by clicking on the little globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Hay interpretación simultánea en español accesible a través del globo chiquito, chiquito abajo en la pantalla. So welcome to our roundtable. Uh, my name is Bianca Mujeni. I'm the director of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, the CFPI, and I'm going to be moderating tonight's discussion. Um, we're also live on Facebook um, at facebook.com slash miningwatch. So please do share with your friends who may not be logged on to the Zoom. Um, we're also going to be posting the Zoom link for anyone who wants to log in directly uh, to be able to access that simultaneous translation uh, on Facebook as well. So before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that many of us are on Indigenous land, Indigenous territory. For my part, I live and work in Montreal or Dojage, um, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangehaga people and the keepers of the eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And it's a place that has long been a point of meeting and exchange among many First Nations. Today, however, I'm quite far from Montreal. I'm on a visit to my ancestral home in Kampala, Uganda, where I was born. So as we can see, um, the participants and the audience um, who are joining us span several continents and time zones. And it's incredible that we're able to come together in this forum for this important discussion. So again, uh, it's wonderful to, to be here with all of you. I also want to thank the organizations that have endorsed and supported this event. Um, there are a lot of them, um, which is very heartening. Um, so we'll post uh, the list of those organizations that are supporting this uh, in the Zoom chat. So please do take a look. Um, on that note, the chat is open. Um, so please do say hi. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, you can also let us know the Indigenous territories that you're currently in. We'd absolutely love to hear from you. Um, we do ask that you keep your comments civil, cordial, and free from racist, sexist, or otherwise harmful commentary. So today we have two sessions, um, which will each be followed by uh, a Q&A. Um, so after our speakers give their remarks, we'll be opening up to questions from the audience. So please do post any questions that you have in the Q&A box and we'll get to um, as many as we can, time permitting. Um, so again, I just want to mention that we have simultaneous translation. Um, interpretation in Spanish is available by clicking that little globe, the icon, the icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, interpretación simultánea en español, accesible a través del globo chiquito abajo en la pantalla. All right. so. The title of today's roundtable discussion is What Does the Murder of Activist Mariano Abarca in Chiapas, Mexico Say About Canadian Government Accountability? So one might think that public servants are obliged to follow policies and procedures that the Canadian government, that Canadian government officials testify to in Parliament or that they publish on the government's website. But a recent federal court ruling says that this isn't necessarily so. Um, and this case is currently before the Federal Court of Appeal. So with support from Mexican and Canadian organizations, the family of environmental defender Mariano Abarca, who was murdered in 2009, is seeking an investigation into the Canadian embassy uh, in Mexico. And they believe that the embassy's unconditional uh, lobbying and support of the Canadian mining company put Mariano's life in greater danger uh, in the lead up to his murder. So with the majority of the world's mineral projects owned or run by Canadian companies, um, this, is a, this is a big conversation and it, and it does have global significance. And so today we'll be discussing uh, Canadian practice when it comes to embassies abroad and conflicts over Canadian mining operations. We're gonna be asking whether Mariano's case is the pattern or whether it's an exception. Um, we'll also be asking whether Mariano's, um, we'll also be exploring what policies Canadian officials should be expected to follow uh, in cases like these um, and how Canadian human rights obligations are, are fulfilled ultimately. And finally, we're going to explore um, whether there's any way to hold public officials to account when things go wrong. So 
We also have a pretty big piece of news. Just this afternoon, we received uh, an important announcement um, that you know, many have been waiting for, and that is that a hearing date has now been set um, for November 8th. So I'm sure we'll be hearing a little bit more about that um, as the event proceeds. So uh, before we begin, just want to remind people again that if you have questions for our speakers, please post them uh, in the Q&A box uh, in the chat. And for people both uh, joining us on Facebook chat, if you'd like Spanish to English translation, um, there's a link to join the Zoom. So our first speaker um, gives me great pleasure to, um, to introduce, um, is joining us from Chicumuselo, Chiapas, Mexico. Jose Luis Abarca Montejo um, is one of Mariano Abarca's four children. He's a lawyer and following Mariano's murder, um, heads the Mariano Abarca Environmental Foundation. He's a leader in the Chiapas chapter of REMA, R-E-M-A, um, the Mexican network of people affected by mining. Welcome, Jose Luis. Thank you very much, Bianca, and good afternoon to everyone. I want to share a little bit about my father. His struggle against the mine here in Chico Muselo. And why we have taken a complaint to Canada to demand an investigation of the Canadian Embassy in Mexico. My father, Mariano Abarca, had four children and ran a restaurant here in Chico Muselo. He was also an important community leader, especially when a barite mine belonging to a Canadian mining company began to cause social and environmental damage in the community. He was also a founder of the Mexican network of people affected by mining, REMA. The company, Blackfire, operated in our municipality from the end of 2007 until the end of 2009. The mine was shut down for environmental violations a few days after my father's murder and has not operated since. My dad was a leader in the social struggle around the mine. In June 2009, he traveled from Chico Muselo to Mexico City with a group from the community and with the support of Otros Mundos Chiapas to participate in a demonstration in front of the Canadian Embassy. As shown in the photo in the promotional material for this webinar. There, he spoke with a representative of the Canadian Embassy. He spoke about the company's unfulfilled promises of work, about the damage that the company's trucks were causing to our houses and roads, and above all, about the contamination of our rivers, which originate in the Sierra Madre de Chiapas. He also talked about a group of company workers who were armed and intimidating him and others. After returning to Chico Muselo, about three weeks later, 
My dad was detained by the police in response to a complaint filed by the mining company. The company made many false accusations against him, saying that he was involved in organized crime, harming the company, and making threats, among other things. Otros Mundos and Rema alerted everyone to send their concerns to the Canadian Embassy. And after eight days, my father was released without trial for lack of evidence. But he was still at great risk, and he said that if anything happened to him, the mining company would be to blame. Three months later, on the 27th of November, 2009, a man shot and killed my dad as he was sitting outside his restaurant. All the people who had any link to the crime were connected to the company. And until today, we have not been able to get a serious investigation. For this reason, we have filed a complaint against the Mexican authorities before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And we have also filed a complaint demanding an investigation into the Canadian Embassy in Mexico. We filed this last complaint because, with the help of several Canadian organizations, including the Steelworkers, Common Frontiers, and Mining Watch Canada, we obtained documents from the Canadian government that show how much the embassy knew and failed to do anything for my father. Well, all the while, it was working to secure the operations of the Black Fire Company. This documentation shows us that even before the mine became operational, the embassy knew that the company was having difficulty reaching agreements with the community. Since then, it has exerted diplomatic pressure on Chiapas state officials to get the mine into operation. Once operating, the documentation also shows that the embassy closely monitored the media in Chiapas about the ongoing protests and learned of the deep discontent of the people. All of this should have been a red flag for the embassy. However, we see in their documents how a member of the embassy dismissed us, saying that we were trying to blackmail the company for more money. Then, after my father went to the embassy in Mexico City in July 2019, and after he was arrested in August 2009, after my father went to the embassy in Mexico City in July 2009, and after he was arrested in August 2009, the embassy received 1,400 letters from all over the Americas expressing great concern for his location 
his well-being and his life. But instead of responding with concern for my father's safety, the embassy took it upon itself to gather information and communicate with the Mexican authorities to dispel doubts about the legitimacy of the mine. Although we do not have a complete record of the embassy's meetings with our authorities, we can see that the embassy sent a delegation to Chiapas in October 2009, a few weeks before my father's murder. They did not talk at all with us or the organizations involved, such as Otros Mundos. Rather, they went to the state government and raised concerns about possible increases in royalty payments charged to Blackfire and asked government officials to quell the protests. Less than six weeks later, my dad was killed by this Canadian mining company. We're not saying that the embassy had my dad killed, but by denying him security support and working solely on behalf of the company, we think they did put him at greater risk and that had they acted differently, things might have been different. My father would not have been killed. This is why we went to Ottawa in February 2018 to file a complaint with the Public Service Integrity Commissioner and why we continue to insist with the federal court that there must be an investigation into the role of the embassy in this case. My father is not coming back. But we think this process can set an important precedent for the many other communities who are at risk because they are fighting to protect their environment and health. From massive mining damage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jose Luis, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, thank you for sharing your father's incredibly important story um, and the details of, uh, of this terrible crime and the ongoing injustice. Um, it's hard to imagine what you and your family have been through. And um, I, I thank you for sharing the details uh, of the case and the disturbing involvement of, of the embassy uh, and the great importance of bringing this case to Canada. So I look forward to hearing more from you uh, in the discussion section, the Q&A. Our next speaker is Miguel Mijengos, who is the contact point for Guerrero in the Mexican network of mining affected people, uh, also known as REMA. Miguel participated in the delegation to Ottawa on behalf of REMA in February 2018 to present the original complaint in the Blackfire case to the Public Service Integrity Commissioner. REMA continues to be a client uh, along with the Abarca family in the judicial review before the Federal Court of Appeal. Miguel, um, I'm wondering if you can tell us how REMA has participated in bringing the complaint against the Canadian Embassy in Mexico to Canada and what, what the importance of this is and how it reflects on Canadian involvement in Mexico and human rights defenders during and since Mariano's murder. Uh, welcome, Miguel. Thank you very much, Bianca, for your introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, to contextualize uh, this network, the REMA, the network 
uh, of people affected by mining. It is present in 16 states of Mexico, the equivalent of your provinces. It is made up of uh, community groups who are in resistance uh, or who are already experiencing the consequences of extractive activities, mining activities. And as you uh, all know, or many of you know, uh, Canada is a major player in the extraction of uh, precious metals in Mexico, uh, platinum, gold, uh, silver. Canada, Canadian companies operate 80% of these uh, mining operations. So it has a very big footprint in the mining sector. And that's why we have such a, an issue with uh, mining, with Canadian mining companies. There is a constant presence of the Canadian government, both structurally, and it's important to say that the uh, current president, actually when he was just president-elect, already the Canadian government, the Canadian embassy had visited uh, his offices, the president, the Mexican president elects offices, which were still being set up, renovated and furnished. They didn't waste any time. They had visited the president elect uh, and have continued to visit him uh, over the years. He's been in power. There has been a constant exchange between the Canadian embassy and the president of Mexico. And this had been the pattern beforehand as well under previous administrations. I'll give you all this context because, of course, the assassination of Mariano, uh, responding to the first question, is this an isolated case, an exception? On the contrary, it is the rule. There is a pattern of conduct, of behavior that is now very well established, has been described currently uh, uh, thoroughly in many reports uh, and has been observed by uh, groups who have supported uh, communities. We've seen how uh, Canadian successive Canadian governments, Canadian mining companies, the officials in the Canadian embassy have acted in ways that have uh, put in place strategies that have been very damaging for people on the ground and in communities. How do we raise the profile of these cases? How do we let the public know that the Canadian mining sector in the area of uh, social and corporate responsibility, these are these are myths these are lies that are, are told and they have serious consequences in terms of the destruction of the environment uh, assassinations intimidation threats all of these uh, elements that mariano described in the case of his father uh, sorry that jose luis described in the case of his father uh, mariano and that led to ultimately the assassination, the killing of Mariano. Mariano was uh, a founder of REMA, of our network. There's a very interesting story there. Uh, when we went to uh, meet with uh, the embassy and to tell them what was going on in Chico Muselo, Mariano took the microphone, took the, the megaphone, and, and just a few uh, months after he was assassinated, we went back to the embassy and a, a, a very important colleague, Betty Carino, took the microphone and a few meses later, uh, she was assassinated. And so we see this pattern uh, uh, that is linked to, very clearly linked, not only to omission, to a lack of action, uh, by politicians, officials in the embassy, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, diplomats and uh, others who are active on the national territory of Mexico. Very quickly, I will give you another example of what has happened uh, in the state of Guerrero to give you uh, some, some further context uh, and to further describe how this is a pattern of behavior of the embassy. One of the regions where uh, currently, after 12 years uh, of the arrival of the first uh, mining company uh, to the state of Guerrero, which was Gold Corp, and then many others arrived, many other companies have uh, succeeded. Uh, there are a number of uh, presently active. Uh, a, a number of them are, are Canadian. There are also some Mexican companies. Uh, this, th they are active in 210 localities, 210 municipalities. And over the last 
10 years, we've seen the displacement of 16,000 families related directly to the violence that uh, comes from a power exercised to protect uh, these uh, mining companies and their interests. So armed groups that are uh, hired to intimidate and protect. So there has been omission, but there has also been uh, a lack of action or, or, or damaging action taken knowing full well what the context was, what the, situ what the situation was. So there's the kind of a political tolerance uh, in which the ambassador uh, often uh, in, in very concrete ways I would say that uh, perhaps the ambassador's favorite is uh, uh, Torex Gold uh, that is involved in the Nueva Luna development, uh, the New Moon development. Uh, he arrives with the governor and with various uh, municipal and armed forces to talk about, to give good speeches, speeches about sustainable development, about corporate social responsibility, about responsibility towards the con uh, uh, towards the community, about consultation and dialogue. And at the same time, that government establishes in those main regions uh, alerts uh, uh, saying that tourists should should not go to Guerrero. The Canadian government on its websites tells Canadians to not visit this part of Mexico because it's dangerous uh, and, and that there are uh, ongoing human rights violations. So for us, this is a very racist way of expressing um, a, a point of view. These Canadian companies that come in and generate conflict in communities, destroy the environment, uh, create all kinds of uh, damage to people's health and well-being. And we see these, this pattern of omissions, both in terms of uh, proper protection uh, and, and uh, consultation, both from the Mexican government and from the Canadian embassy and the Canadian government. And then afterwards, these things are swept under the uh, uh, carpet and hidden hidden in, in, in lovely language uh, and, and myths. Uh, around capital arriving uh, to create development. Well, out of the other side of their mouths, they're telling Canadian tourists to not visit this part of the country because it's so dangerous. So there's this constant colonial racist uh, uh, rhetoric. And those of us who are accompanying communities on the ground, who are trying to uh, work with them and, and trying to face down these Canadian companies, we see a time and uh, time again that we are not given the same kind of support uh, from the diplomatic mission of Canada, from the ambassador and on down through the staff of the embassy. Uh, over these last 12 months, last 12 years in Guerrero, we've seen this time and time again as a pattern. Uh, and not only does it leave us with uh, uh, terrible stories like uh, the story of Jose Luis's father, Mariano, but it's important to also say that in this current uh, government, we have the longest list, the highest rate of assassinations related to defense of the land, defense of the territories. Many, many of these assassinations are directly related to uh, this attempt of communities to resist. And so uh, Mariano, once again, was a founder of our network, a very important uh, actor. And we continue his work. We continue to position ourselves uh, in resistance because we want justice. We want an end to impunity and corruption. And we want to work on accountability. We want the Canadian government to be more accountable. We don't only want uh, economic and financial penalties. That seems to be the way of capitalism. That is to say, I can uh, damage a community and environment as much as possible as long as I pay the fines after. No, that's not what we want to see going on. We think that remediation uh, for uh, and compensation for uh, damages is uh, uh, for people to be held criminally responsible to go to jail and we want the Canadian government to uh, demand of its companies uh, to behave better on the ground so that's the context I would give you and that's why we are continue continuing to accompany Mari uh, Mariano's family a number of us have gone to uh, Canada and uh, we want to, without fear, raise the profile of this case, let Canadians know what is going on on the ground. Uh, it's very surprising, the news that we just heard, uh, that we are finally going to get our 
a day in court and be able to uh, participate in a hearing. I, I'm not surprised uh, uh, that this day uh, was chosen, that date was chosen. Uh, I know the tendency uh, of the Canadian government uh, to want to uh, clean up its reputation by saying, look, we've given you a day in court, this is being dealt with, so we're happy that we have this day in court. But we've also been shown by, uh, that the Canadian government has fought us every uh, step of the way, the way they've treated us has been uh, very poor. And so it's very important that we continue this struggle, that we participate in these uh, processes without at the same time forgetting that we're not only uh, struggling to raise the profile of this case, but that we want real accountability. We want those responsible to be held accountable uh, criminally, if that is uh, justified, to get true justice for uh, Mariano's uh, family, for Jose Luis's family. Ca Canadian companies cannot come and kill uh, Mexicans and their communities and not be held a company. If you have questions, I'm here. We we'll be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel, uh, for your brave and critical work, um, and also for your call to dispel the myths of Canadian corporate responsibility, um, certainly when it comes to mining abroad, and for you know illuminating this just serious damage, displacement, intimidation faced by these communities, um, and for pointing out the terrifying pattern of violence towards human rights defenders. Um, and the just the racism colonialism. So I think our audience has has learned a lot from you today, and I encourage people to find out more about the work of Rema um, as you raise the profile of this case. And we'll hear from you uh, again during the Q and A period. So thank you very much. Our next speaker of the evening is uh, is is Karis Campus. Uh, Karis is an associate professor at Thompson Rivers University Faculty of Law and a founding member of the Justice and Corporate Accountability project. She spent the last 10 years working with law students, lawyers, academics, and organizations across Canada and abroad <clears throat> and abroad as well on a variety of corporate and government accountability cases in the area of extractive industries, the environment, and human rights. Um, Karis, welcome. Thank you, Bianca. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to join this um, this, this event from the unceded territory of the Tekemlubs Tesequatmak people in Sequatmak Ulu um, in English in uh, Kamloops, BC. Uh, it's an honor to share this panel with Jose Luis and Miguel Angel, who I met when we first presented uh, the complaint um, that underlies the Federal Court of Appeal uh, process in Ottawa. And um, I'm very um, sort of grateful for the opportunity as well to share uh, an, another case study that JCAP has been working on uh, for many years, since 2014 actually, uh, and does uh, some important uh, work, I think, to further um, outline and flesh out the, the harms uh, that are done by Canadian econo economic diplomacy. Uh, in another context and adding uh, on to the analysis of economic diplomacy. In um, Mariano's case, we saw the total disregard for uh, Canada's domestic policies, uh, CSR policies that applied, and uh, the, the risk that Canada's conduct put uh, Mariano's uh, in, uh, as well as uh, other issues that are raised in the case. Uh, in this study, um, some of those same issues are present, but uh, an added sort of set of concerns relates to how, as you see in the title there, uh, Canadian economic diplomacy uh, worked to undermine uh, international institutions. And in that particular, in this particular case, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which is a, a branch of the Organization of American States. Um, so, I'm presenting today, but this work has been sort of is only possible because of the work of many others who I could not possibly name, uh, but one person in particular who's the co-author of the report uh, that this uh, sort of uh, case study will be presented in, uh, Charlotte Conley 
uh, has been sort of critical in bringing this uh, work to its final stages of, of publication. So I want to recognize her in particular. Um, so this conflict, Marlin Mine conflict uh, in Guatemala, uh, the company involved with Gold Corp is probably well known to many uh, sitting in this uh, webinar, although I'm sure for many as well, it is uh, a, new, uh, a new story. Uh, it's very complex and I can't do justice to, it, justice to it sort of here, but the three essential elements that I see in many of these conflicts, the vast majority really uh, were at play. So a lack of consultation and consent, uh, on the part of affected communities, um, inadequate regulation and government institutions uh, that sort of underpinned uh, uh, serious risk of environmental contamination of the project. And then sort of the inevitable result of these two things, uh, protests, widespread protests, uh, activism, criminalization of community leaders and violence. And so these uh, elements were well studied um, at the time by international bodies academics, experts, civil society organizations. It was a very um, well-studied case. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of attention on it, uh, much more, I would say, than most other conflicts, uh, which is an important context for analyzing Canada's response. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, or at one point in time, the, in 2010, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights issued precautionary measures requesting that Guatemala suspend the Marlin mine and properly investigate and address community concerns around water quality. And so it's important to understand that in this international uh, process uh, or legal proceeding, neither Canada nor the company Gold Corp were party to the proceedings. Nonetheless, in our research, uh, looking at uh, sort of 900 pages of access to information, uh, records, uh, we see uh, the enormous mobilization of Canada's political capital, political resources uh, to basically counteract or undermine this uh, uh, order from the commission. So uh, two Canadian ambassadors were involved, two ministers of cabinet and numerous diplomatic officials. Um, uh, so uh, in analyzing these actions, we've tried to develop a sort of framework or set of standards um, that we can use to evaluate Canada's uh, conduct in this case. Uh, and these standards are sort of developed from the policies uh, and, uh, and uh, legal, legal principles that were in place at the time. And so to, sort of to make it very simplified, uh, there's three main issues that we see with Canada's uh, conduct and response. Uh, the first is uh, a failure to undertake due diligence and consider all of the evidence um, uh, that supported uh, communities' concerns. Uh, and we extrapolate this sort of duty from Canada's CSR policy, where it says that it expects companies to uh, uphold international standards and respect human rights. The second set of concerns relates to Canada's failure to uh, respect uh, promote the respect, I should say, for human rights and compliance with the, with the Inter-American Commission. And the final issue that we identify is a, a failure to respect the independence and the impartiality of the Inter-American Commission. Uh, and so you see there where we source uh, mainly uh, these different duties on the part of Canada. So uh, there's a lot here, but just this is sort of my main slide. And with this, uh, I, I, I'm, I can really wrap up. But there's a number of key findings. You see five here on the screen. And this is partly why I used a PowerPoint, because um, uh, there's a lot. And it's important to sort of break it down uh, briefly. Um, the first thing we observed Canada doing is working to really undermine the order of the Inter-American Commission by suggesting that it was flawed. Uh, and, and Canada did this without actually looking into the underlying evidence uh, and really considering the, all of the uh, credible research that had been done and that, uh, that suggested or concluded that communities' concerns were valid. The other really concerning uh, sets of behavior that we saw was Canada putting high-level pressure, including Canadian ministers and cabinet, on the Guatemalan government not to comply uh, with the Inter-American Commission's precautionary measures. 
uh, working strategically with Guatemala and Gold Corp to uh, sort of manage uh, to Gold Corp's benefit uh, the Inter-American Commission's on-site investigation. So commissioners traveled to Guatemala and met with communities to, to try to understand the issues. Um, we saw Canadian officials working to obtain information from the Inter-American Inter Commission, again, an independent body at Gold Corp's request, and then sharing that information with the company and strategizing around it. Um, we see in the records, Inter-American officials cautioning Canada to respect the independence. So we, we, we see that there were uh, concerns expressed about how far um, these actions were going. And then the final piece that we saw in terms of these specific legal proceedings is Canada working with Gold Corp to figure out how the company might best insert itself into the legal process. Uh, with a view to exercising influence over the process. And ultimately, Gold Corp was able to secure a private meeting with um, one of the inter-American commissioners that was actually hearing the case. Uh, so those are our main findings, and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. So we've taken, uh, similar to Mariano's case, we've taken uh, this to uh, the federal courts uh, in a in a different um, sort of frame, so not uh, seeking uh, directly accountability of the Canadian Embassy. Uh, we've seen how difficult that has been in Mariano's case, and we had an opportunity here to raise instead the issue of lack of transparency, so um, raising concerns with the courts that um, the Canadian government has censored or redacted parts of the documents uh, inappropriately or in a way that is not grounded in um, the legislation that governs in this area. Uh, so we've done this with the support of many law students, um, as well as uh, the organizations that you see uh, listed there and the law firm as well, um, uh, who, uh, who's been working pro bono uh, in support of this case. Um, we expect a decision from uh, the federal court soon, so perhaps the timing will be uh, sort of compatible with as well the hearing of uh, Mariano's case at the federal court of appeal. And uh, I know there's going to be sort of a part two to this, this session in terms of enforcement and accountability and some of the legal um, kind of discussions around that, uh, and so I won't get into that in this presentation, but Certainly, our case study uh, points to pro uh, governance problems with uh, economic diplomacy and how CSR policies fail to address uh, the harms that we see. Uh, there's serious lack of transparency and reporting on uh, compliance with policies, um, uh, almost no mechanisms at all for oversight or accountability when officials fail to follow policy. The norms that apply to the conduct of public officials are vague and weak. And we see also in the records um, a lot of evidence of uh, real hostility and prejudice, I would say, on the part of public officials toward um, civil society organizations and human rights defenders. So we also believe there's a serious sort of cultural problem within global affairs. Um, that needs to be named and addressed in order for any sort of governance or accountability um, approach to, to really be effective. So um, with that, I'll just put up this quickly this slide in terms of some of the pieces of our forthcoming report that elaborate on all of this in significantly more detail. Um, it it uh, gets more into the context of the, the human rights violations that, that uh, a large body of research identified going on at Marlin Mine, developing that framework of, of law and policy obligations that apply to Canada in this context, a deeper analysis of Canada's um, failures uh, in this case, uh, far beyond what I could give here, and then uh, recommendations for policy and law reform uh, that we also try to link to the, the proposed due diligence legislation um, from, from Canadian organizations. Uh, so with that, I believe um, happy to talk more about how this connects to Mariano's case and broader strategic sort of um, planning. Uh, and thank you very much for, for the, the opportunity to participate and share this, this relatively new research. A long time coming, but sort of new in terms of the publication piece. So thank you, everyone. 
Thank you, Karis. Thank you so much for sharing um, for sharing your report and for drawing these comparisons um, uh, with this case study of the Marlin Mine and IACHR. It really does help to shed light on the, the harms done by Canadian economic diplomacy. And then just the many deep failures to comply with policy also found myself quite troubled by the actions, negative influence um, and hostility you described of the Canadian government. So as has been pointed out by several speakers uh, already today, uh, these appear to be patterns and not the exception. So I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. Our next speaker is Jen Moore. Jen Moore is an associate fellow with the Global Economy Program at the Institute for Policy Studies and was Mining Watch's first full-time Latin America program coordinator. She's worked on the Black Fire case since 2010 in close collaboration with the Abarfa family, Rema, and others. Um, and Jen's joining us from Mexico City. So Jen, I'd love to know what patterns of economic diplomacy you're seeing globally and in Canada specifically, what shape has our political influence taken when it comes to Canadian minds? Welcome, uh, welcome Jen. Thanks so much, Bianca, and to all of the organizers and supporters of this event. And I, I just also want to express a lot of gratitude to Karis and the whole team of people at the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project for so much help in working to document these cases and to them and the others who are going to participate in the second hour of this event for the legal work in Mariano's case that we're excited is now coming up for a hearing at the Federal Court of Appeal. So. I want to I want to touch briefly on the patterns that we're seeing with Canada's economic diplomacy, both at the project level and at the policy level. First, it's important to recall the Canada's substantial position in the globalized mining industry. Nearly half of the world's publicly traded mining companies list on Canadian stock exchanges and raise more capital for the industry than any other exchange. In Guatemala, Canadian mining investment has played a central role in opening up the sector following the 36 internal year internal armed conflict that ended in 1996 and the genocide against the indigenous population. And in Mexico, as Miguel referred to, Canada is the largest foreign investor in the mining sector. This just to give you a sense of the level of influence Canada has to wield. And it's notable that since 2007, the Canadian Foreign Service has employed what it calls a whole of government approach to the promotion and protection of Canadian trade and direct investment. Economic diplomacy is part of this, which in the words of the government means all diplomatic assets are harnessed to support the pursuit of commercial success by Canadian companies and investors. This service is a huge attraction for Canadian domiciled mining companies. Not too long ago, Kelvin Dushnitsky, the former president of Barrick Gold, a company that's been at the center of social and environmental conflicts in countries like the Dominican Republic, New Guinea and Tanzania said, there's a strong element of support from the Canadian government and in our ability to wrap ourselves in the Canadian flag. We found that to be extremely effective as we operate abroad. So what do we see at the project level? Well, it's the same thing time and again. Not only did the Canadian embassy play an active role back in Gold Coast unwanted mining operations at the Marlin Mine, as Karis just described, Canadian embassy representatives also were active in denying Canadian complicity in brutal violence against Mayan Kekchi communities around the Phoenix nickel mine in Eastern Guatemala in 2007. They also provided instrumental support to a gold core spin-off company, Tajo Resources, in the lead up and the aftermath of putting the Escobal mine into operation in, southeast, in Southwest Guatemala in 2014, all despite broad-based well-known community resistance over concerns about potential mining impacts on water, health, and livelihoods. In Mexico, Jose Luis talked about what happened in the case of Blackfire in Chiapas, illustrating how the Canadian embassy has shown itself to have corporate interests at heart when they troubleshoot for companies, despite knowledge of community complaints and risks of violence. And things have only gotten worse. 
As Miguel, Miguel describes, Canadian representatives in Mexico have more recently demonstrated that they will even show up to lend Canadian mining operations legitimacy where communities are terrorized by organized crime and where there are public allegations that the company has a criminal organization on its payroll. Notably, and I wanna talk about a specific instance, Miguel referred to Torex Gold. Well, in April, 2016, the Canadian ambassador to Mexico, then Pierre Alari, joined the governor of Guerrero to celebrate the inauguration of Torex Gold's mine in Cocula, Guerrero. This is the same Cocula where the Mexican government once alleged that 43 disappeared students from a rural teacher's college in Ayotzinapa were burned in a garbage dump. It did not seem to matter to the Canadian embassy that a mine manager had already been murdered, that workers had been kidnapped in connection with this mine project, or that communities were protesting over unfulfilled agreements, contaminated water and health problems. Nor was it apparently of concern that one month after the ribbon cutting ceremony, those same communities complained in the press about being under siege from organized crime and for a lack of response from the governor, the same governor to ensure their safety. At the same time, that mine site was reportedly guarded by all levels of state armed forces. When the Canadian ambassador was asked by the Mexican press um, about the insecurity, he wrote it off as a generalized pro problem, suggesting to the press that a direct connection could not be made with Canadian mining companies. It is hard to fathom when companies are operating in an area known to be controlled by organized crime, acting in collusion with the state, where there are reports of communities and wor workers being extorted, and when extreme violence and massive displacement occur with frequency, that if companies are not contributing to such horrors directly or indirectly, they're profiting from them. Canadian di diplomats also intervene at the policy level for mining companies. And here I'll just touch briefly on how in the aftermath of the military coup in Honduras, Canadian authorities used aid dollars and diplomatic influence to prevent community and civil society driven reforms from being introduced into the mining code. Hondurans had been working for years and also as the result of great impacts from a Canadian owned mining project, another gold core project in the Syria Valley and uh, the San Martin mine. Uh, and because of the impacts of that, people realized that their existing mining code, which had been pushed through during the wake of a hurricane in 1998 provided no recourse. So they were fighting to ban open pit mining, to prohibit certain toxins from being used in mine process, processing, and for communities to be able to decide what could take place on their land or not. To make things short, um, they managed to get a bill before uh, their legislature but it was not debated because of a military backed coup that happened in June of 2019, one that Canada failed to denounce or sanction. But after elections that took place several months later that were widely criticized as illegitimate, Canadian authorities wasted absolutely no time to lobby for a mining law that would suit the industry and lift the moratorium. It did just that. And four years later, uh, got that law using Canadian aid, a Honduran delegation to the annual mining convention in Toronto, um, and, and paying for the technical support that wrote the law uh, in order to get that passed and to lift the moratorium on mining, which has opened the gates to mining projects in what's now one of the most violent countries in the region. This is just one example of how if the Canadian government has been supposedly strengthening laws and the rule of law around the world, it's been to put transnational corporations at greater advantage over the lives of current and future generations. So in contrast to Canada's willingness to intervene on behalf of mining capital, Canadian embassies have tended to back off when credible allegations of abuses and threats to land and environment defenders are raised in the context of mining conflicts. They have argued uh, that they cannot interfere, interfere with the sovereignty of another nation or that a given company is not quite Canadian enough to warrant the embassy's involvement. But such diplomatic restraint not only denies support to communities struggling against mining harms, 
It reinforces impunity for corporate abuses and authoritarian regimes. In 2016, the Canadian government published Voices at Risk, Canada's guidelines on supporting human rights defenders. These guidelines suggest that support will be provided in cases involving Canadian corporations, but it is difficult to find any evidence that these guidelines have made any difference in how Canadian authorities respond to land and environment defenders today. Rather, what we see is Canada managing risks for companies, not communities. And for things to really change, I agree with what's been said today. We need to be talking about greater accountability we need this investigation into the Canadian Embassy in Mexico that's now before the Federal Court of Appeal. And at the same time, we need a serious reckoning about what sort of economic development Canada is promoting and protecting around the world to take stock of the intensifying violence and legal persecution against affected people, as well as the social, economic and ecological disasters that are mounting alongside these Canadian mining operations. What happened in 2010 around the Marlin mine in Guatemala continues today. The stress, the impacts of what Blackfire did in 2009 continue today. All of these disasters continue. And until we have that reckoning, the Canadian flag is gonna have a really hard time shaking the neo-colonial connotations that it has earned as a tireless mining promoter around the world. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, for your clear insights into Canada's role as a global mining superpower, um, its tremendous influence and impacts, and also the ways in which the myth of Canadian benevolence abroad has in part allowed these uh, abuses to continue with impunity and just the, the profiting that's taken place from, from these horrors, as you say. So, um, so that concludes um, the, uh, the presentations for the first half of this um, session today, the round table, and we're now moving on to the first Q&A portion of the evening. So we have, we have received a few questions. Um, the first question that we have is, uh, is for Karis or Jen, and um, it's what progress, uh, what's the progress of the case before the IACHR? Um, uh, I should say, uh, thanks for the question. Um, it hasn't been easy to always get information about the case. Um, and um, so I wouldn't consider myself to be the, the most informed, uh, but we have been working with um, some partners uh, who are working to sort of bring this research to affected communities, which, which I've been really grateful for. Uh, and, and that's been in connection with the organizations that we're working with. Um, uh, but what we do know is that the case uh, was admitted, so it passed the admissibility stage, um, uh, and that the Inter-American Commission were still waiting for the decision on the merits. Um, and we also know that the precautionary measures are still in place, uh, and that there are significant, or at least some of them, I shouldn't say all of them, the original, but there are still some in place. And that um, uh, communities uh, report that they haven't been properly fulfilled, so that certain kinds of harms have not been addressed, uh, and so harm is ongoing. Uh, concerns about the closure of the mine are ongoing, uh, and in our report we look at um, this is actually a, a critical message. Uh, we we are we argue that our findings. Um, raise uh, uh, the need for a conversation about Canada's direct responsibility for the ongoing harms, uh, given the fact that the company is now long gone, uh, actually doesn't even exist anymore, it merged with Newmont, um, and uh, harms are sort of uh, still ongoing, and we can see that Canada uh, took uh, very serious steps to really undermine communities' efforts to seek justice in that particular moment about between 2010 and 2011, which was really a critical moment uh, in, in the struggle, in their struggle. So, so, we, so we think that there are some really serious outstanding issues that, that, that can be uh, the focus of, of important advocacy uh, in collaboration with affected communities. Thank you. 
Thank you, Karis. And um, the next question is um, is for Jose Luis or for Miguel, and it's what are what are the demands to the Mexican state? Eh, yo, yo le dejaría la respuesta. I will let Jose Luis answer this question. The question again? What are the demands um, or what are some of the demands that are being made to the Mexican state around this case? Sí, este, la, pues la investigación en el... Yes, well, the investigation here in the state of Chiapas has not continued. It seems that the Mexican authorities have wanted to uh, archive and, and uh, close this case, this investigation for the, for the time being. That seems to be the state of affairs. And so the, uh, that's the demand that we've made is that the, the case be reopened and the investigation continued. Thank you. The next question is for Jen. Um, what progress has been made in the investigation to identify and punish the intellectual and material perpetrators of the murder of Mariano Abarca? Sorry, I just want to clarify one thing before I, I answer the question. I just wanted to clarify, and I've put it in the chat, that there's sort of, there's two cases before the Inter-American Commission, the one concerning the Marlon mine in Guatemala, which is what Karis was responding to. Um, so not to give the impression that the, the case before the Inter-American Commission in the case of Blackfire and the murder of Mariano Barca is still awaiting notification about um, its status and whether it'll be admitted. Um, and sorry, can I just ask you to repeat the, the question? Just... For sure, yeah. Um, so the question from the audience is, what progress has been made in the investigation to identify and punish the intellectual and material perpetrators of the murder of Mariano Barca? Yes, I think Jose Luis could also um, clarify this, but uh, very little. Um, there, there were some initial um, arrests, everybody was released. It is important to mention that everybody who was arrested within um, the first year or so um, uh, had direct connections in one, one form or another to Blackfire. Um, and since that time, there have been various attempts to try to get the prosecutor's office to continue to investigate the case that have so far been uh, disappointing and unsuccessful, which has been the motivation for bringing the, uh, the case before the Inter-American Commission in the case of the Mexican authorities. Thank you. Um, we have another question here for Karis, but um, I certainly think anyone could, could answer this. Um, how does the Marlin case connect to the Mariano case? I know you've um, sort of, uh, you know, address this a little bit, but uh, perhaps some elaboration could help. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are many connections. I think the underlying um, concerns around consent, environmental contamination, and criminalization of violence are are there, and I see those, frankly, in every single case that I've studied um, in the last ten years. Um, uh, but for the purposes of economic diplomacy, a common uh, uh, theme, again, is the, the total disregard on the part of Canadian officials for applicable policies. We often see that they don't even avert to them or uh, acknowledge they exist, even though, as we observe, they're on Canadian government websites, they talk about them in, the, in Parliament, they talk about them in international meetings, um, uh, so that's a common theme. Um, one, one distinction quickly that I'll point out is that in the Abarca case, we, we are alleging that uh, Abarca's harm was connected to the actions of Canadian officials and that there was wrongdoing under the legislation applicable in Canada. Uh, in the uh, Marlin case, what we're looking at is disregard for international law and disregard for international human rights institutions and um, and this the the search for justice in those institutions. So there's some differences, but a lot of similarities, different contexts in different moments in time. Thank you. 
Um, we have a, another question in uh, in the chat. Um, uh, and this one is for Jose Luis. Um, has there been any change in the attitude of the Chiapas governor or government after the election of, uh, of uh, it says a Morena candidate? Este, no, no creo que. No. Just the color of the, of the party and the uh you know acronym of the party changed but it it it's the status quo in terms of the the government's the state government's approach to uh, mining and what's happening in my community uh, it's uh, steady as she goes and they're continuing the same thank you um so this uh this question is um for everyone but maybe especially uh, jose luis and miguel um what can people living in Canada do to support this case? Well, if you'll allow me, it's always a complex question because in many in places we have been so beaten down by our local structures and by national international uh, structures governments institutions and so uh, we uh, feel like we're running out of ideas in terms of how we can act together and be in solidarity in terms of the relationship we have with canada and with canadians it would be very helpful to us to raise the profile of this case, uh, particularly in the mainstream media. I think that a lot of Canadians are starting to learn, starting to discover that uh, the story of Canadian mining around the world uh, is a myth, uh, that there is a real underbelly and dark side to this. But we, we, there needs to be more work uh, of public awareness raising and education to really uh, 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 so that Canadians really understand that that's the case. This is a, a real lack, a gap that we have in Latin America uh, as well. That is that there is always a lot of strength uh, uh, in the struggle uh, against environmental violations, against uh, assassinations of human rights defenders. But practically speaking, uh, we're always back to uh, square one, particularly in the area of health and the effect on health. Uh, the experience that I mentioned with the Movimiento uh, Mesoamericano uh, and the effect of Gold Corp on the health of uh, c communities that was in Guerrero, in in Guatemala, and was also working in Honduras, in, in the Siria Valley. We came together for a first effort to look from another point of view, another angle, at the uh, uh, damages that we had uh, suffered. Of course, uh, health uh, has been severely affected but we couldn't seem to break through and, and get people to understand concretely what this meant when we started to document what it meant to people personally you know what it meant to me personally what it meant to other individuals uh, personally and, and how it's had an effect on our health and then we could really see it clearly the uh, uh, damage to the environment to nature uh, uh, seem sometimes uh, small to some uh, compared to the damage to bodies, the bodies of individuals, of community members. Perhaps this doesn't seem like a strong uh, argument, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to uh, convey the seriousness. Uh, you know, when a tailings dam breaks, uh, 
uh, immediately what gets covered in the media is uh, the damage that's done to nature, to animals. You know, you see pictures of, of, of um, uh, fish. And then there's always a lot of emphasis on the engineering. Was the engineering uh, uh, done properly? Why did the dam break? Was there uh, um, corruption? Uh, was it intentional or, or was it negligence? And so on. But what is covered much less and what has a much lower profile, and if you look at all of the laws that we have in Latin American countries, you will not find in any of these laws a single article that talks about uh, damage done to individuals to people to their health and so that's where there's a real need to raise awareness to raise the profile that, that is a huge gap processes at the local level to document uh, this these effects on health and we always are met with a rhetoric uh, uh, that says oh, well you have to show that the the lead came from the mine or is it just because you continue to make your tortillas with uh, uh, firewood that has lead in it you know how can you prove to us that it's from the mine so uh, uh, w what this is doing to actual human bodies you know it's so easy uh, to beat that argument uh, down and 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 so uh, doubt we can talk about the case of guerrero 70 dead in one community in the context of violence generated by a mining uh a facility uh, but then we can also talk about so that's 70 but then we can talk about the 150 who have died of uh, cancer and of other illnesses directly related to contamination from the mine. And uh, so where, where does the buck stop? Whose responsibility is this, that children are dying uh, of cancer? There's no reason for this. It's very hard to show this. Uh, and it's very hard for the communities and, and the peoples on the ground. We take lead and heavy metals out of uh, bodies. How do we set up tr treatment facilities and clinics for people to go to? I mean, I don't know that there re is po the possibility of real remediation. So this is something that uh, Canadians can do. We need to render more visible this very complex situation. And there's there's a real issue around health, around human health that needs to have a greater profile that we need to discuss. More. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all, uh, all of our presenters for your um, for your answers. Thank you for the brilliant questions as well. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break right now, um, about three minutes. And during this time, we'll also be playing a short video, Justice for Mariano. Uh, which tells his story through images. So we're just going to take a pause and we'll see you back here in about three minutes for the second half of our roundtable, which will be focused on approaches to enforcement. See you all very soon. Blackfire began mining for barite in early 2008, when community discontent in Chico Muselo was already apparent. The company was grateful to the Canadian Embassy in Mexico for helping it obtain the final permit from Mexican authorities. As a local resident and founding member of the Mexican Network of Mining Affected Peoples, Mariano Abarca started speaking out in 2008 about the current and potential impacts of the mine on rivers and land. Tenemos conocimiento del, ahora sí, del daño que está ocasionando también ya en algunas partes por esta actividad de lo, del, del municipio, este, específicamente en el ejido Nueva Morelia, donde ya hay unas partiduras, unas grietas este, por la cantidad de explosivos que están utilizando. Mariano and family members were robbed and beaten by employees of the mine in August 2008. He registered a complaint but the state ignored it until after his murder. In June 2009, Mariano and other Chico Muselo community members began a peaceful protest, calling for the mine to be permanently closed. 
In July, they demonstrated outside Canada's embassy in Mexico City to draw attention to their struggle. Sí, nos está afectando gravemente, además del conflicto social que se vive ya en el ejido, porque la compañía está utilizando a los trabajadores, a sus trabajadores como grupos de choque. To discredit Mariano, Blackfire accused him of organized crime and other wrongdoings. Mariano was taken into police custody for eight days without charge in August 2009. His whereabouts kept secret from family and friends. Released following an international campaign directed at the Mexican state and the Canadian embassy, he continued to receive threats. A few days after making yet another complaint, he was murdered in broad daylight in front of his house on November 27, 2009. All suspects are linked to Blackfire exploration. The lack of a full and impartial investigation means that no one is currently under arrest for his murder. everybody welcome back welcome back uh, from the break um, we concluded the first part of our roundtable which was focused on economic diplomacy and we're now moving on to the second part of our roundtable which is in approaches to enforcement um, so joining us first um, for this half is Nicholas Pope Nicholas is a human rights lawyer at Hamid Law in Ottawa and he's part of the legal team arguing Mariano Abarca's case before the Federal Court of Appeal. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you, Bianca. I'm going to very briefly review the proceedings that have happened so far in this case and let you know what we'll be arguing at the Federal Court of Appeal on November 8th. Let me share my screen here. So, in the initial complaint uh, that was put forward on February 5th, 2018, uh, JCAP uh, submitted to the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner that there's two different types of wrongdoing that went on in Mariano Barca's case. Uh, and I apologize for giving you legislation, but I've highlighted in blue some of the key points here. And that's 8D, uh, which is that there were acts or omissions by the embassy that created danger to his life and that there were serious breaches of codes of conduct. So the complaint alleged that the acts of the embassies advocating to the Chiapas government on behalf of Blackfire and the embassy's omission failing to raise human rights concerns with Blackfire and with the Chiapas government uh, contributed to the danger to Mariano Barca's life. And then under section 8E, there are a variety of different codes of conduct that have been in place throughout the years and may come into play. But the, the gist of the provisions is that it's not good enough for public servants to merely follow the law. They have to abide by this higher standard. They have to abide by policies and ministerial directives that have been put forward. And the complaint identified a few of these. I'll just mention three. One is this corporate social responsibility um, document as you see here as it currently is on the government website which says that the government will encourage companies to abide by a high standard of corporate social responsibility which was not done here the second is this human rights defender policy which states that canada's network of missions abroad pursues objectives related to the promotion and protection of the rights of human rights defenders and we can see that this year is in a memo uh, to the minister of foreign affairs but it has at various times been on government websites. And a third one is this policy on community company conflicts, which says that the officials will facilitate dialogue without getting in the middle when there have been allegations of Canadian companies uh, doing wrongdoing abroad. 
And so this here, you can see it was in a PowerPoint uh, to the minister. You can see it was in uh, the talking points that the minister made to the Toronto Star and to the Canadian public when the minister was saying, this is what we do. Um, so telling the Canadian public that our officials will facilitate this dialogue. It was also just days after Mariano's murder, uh, almost verbatim from these talking points of the Toronto Star, echoed by a senior Department of Foreign Affairs official to a parliamentary committee. Uh, when that committee was examining, putting in some stronger enforcement measures for these sort of uh, rights abuses, uh, this official said, well, you don't really need them. Here's some issues with this new bill. But look, we already have this, po this policy in place or ready to do this practice of facilitating a dialogue. So the complaint was also full of many footnotes. It cited 79 documents, there's thousands of pages um, supporting the claims, but those weren't included physically with the complaint, but uh, those who submitted it said to the commissioner, we're here, we have all the documents, just ask us if you need any of these. Now, the commissioner came out with his decision and decided not to investigate, saying that there was no reason to believe any wrongdoing was committed because uh, under 8D, the embassy didn't ignore human rights concerns. And under 8E, these policies that were put forward were not so-called official government of Canada policies, and they didn't, and I quote, prescribe specific actions, end quote. Now, the record of the decision revealed to us that he only reviewed three of the 79 documents referenced in the complaint. Now, none of the documents were physically included in the complaint, but the commissioner went out on his own and found three of these documents, uh, but didn't, apparently, at least from the record, didn't look at the other documents that actually supported the fact that the embassy didn't, or in fact, did ignore human rights complaints or the, uh, that show how official, in fact, these policies were. So uh, this was taken up to the federal court and uh, the federal court declined to overturn the commissioner's decision. And I won't get into all the details of it, but if you read the decision, it appears that the court did not analyze the section eight wrong, 8D wrongdoing. So that's the question of whether an act or a mission of uh, the embassy uh, led to some danger to Mariano Labarca's life or safety. They really focused on the policies and then Almost as an afterthought, it was the third last paragraph of the judgment. The court wrote this. Undoubtedly, the applicants would have liked the embassy to have acted in a certain way, and perhaps Mr. Abarca would not have been murdered, which to me looks very similar to, to saying that an omission by the embassy did in fact create a danger to his life. But now we're going up before the Federal Court of Appeal. And the hearing has been set for November 8th. Due to the nature of the, the decision, the court won't overturn the decision merely because it disagrees with the decision. Uh, in an administrative law, which is this area of law, they will overturn the decision if it's either unreasonable or procedurally unfair. And we believe that it is both. So we believe that the decision is unreasonable first with regard to the act or emissions creating a danger to Mariano Abarca's life. We think it was unreasonable for the commissioner to conclude that the embassy did not ignore human rights concerns merely because it met with the Chiapas government um, because the commissioner seemed to ignore the evidence which outlined the actual content of what was in these meetings. And some of that, I'll just bring you to two of these. Uh, this here is an email from um, outlining what happened in these embassy meetings shortly after Mariano Abarca was detained. And they say that uh, Blackfire sent a letter uh, to the embassy and they shared that with the Mexican government. And here the embassy took immediate steps to contact a variety of Chiapas and Mexican government agencies. And why did they do this? To signal our concern with relevant authorities and players about any allegation of illegal activity surrounding Canadian investments in Mexico. So they didn't do it to signal their concern about the potential danger to Mariano Barca's life or any threats towards him or his detention. It was uh, to protect their Canadian mining company. And we see that in, in more documents describing the work of the embassy. Uh, this one here talks about how the post, that's the embassy, has intervened at senior levels to troubleshoot for the four Canadian mining investments in Mexico and what was their goal. 
the goal was to advocate for greater attention by Chiapas to try to resolve challenges that Black Fire is facing. So there's nothing in the rest of these documents about promoting human rights or protecting Mariano Albarca, only about promoting the mine's interests. And we say that's unreasonable for the commissioner to then say uh, that human rights was not ignored. Uh, we also say that uh, it was unreasonable because uh, in, uh, in saying that no, the, no code of conduct was breached, the commissioner added this extra criteria that they have to be official government of Canada policies and, policies and prescribe specific actions. Uh, and also that the commissioner didn't account for the evidence before him, which indicated that these policies were in fact official. They were spoken to the Canadian public and, and testified in parliamentary committees. And as a third point, the decision was unreasonable because now this is a very long piece of legislation, but essentially the threshold for an investigation to be started is whether the commissioner has reason to believe that a wrongdoing was committed, not whether the commissioner is convinced that a wrongdoing is committed. And we believe that he acted, uh, he created too high of an evidentiary threshold at this preliminary investigation stage. Finally, uh, we'll argue that it's procedurally unfair because of these new criteria of official policies or prescribing specific actions that were added in, and because of the manner in which the commissioner reviewed the evidence, uh, looking at three of these documents that he went out and found on his own, um, but uh, not actually looking at the documents that were cited in footnotes as supporting uh, the claims that he then rejected. So we say, if you're going to reject a claim that someone makes that human rights were ignored or that this is an official policy, then you have, you have to read the footnote, you have to read the cited evidence. If you don't bother looking at the evidence, you can't then reject the claim. Uh, so that's a very brief summary of our arguments. Of course, there, there'll be much more in depth, but uh, I just wanna mention, we're very fortunate to be joined by a number of interveners with expertise in specific areas uh, who you will hear from very soon. And I'll turn it back to Bianca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. It's great to have your expertise and also just to have the details of this case laid out so clearly um, for a better understanding of just how important it is that this case has come to Canada. Um, you know, it's troubling to hear about the seeming lack of concern for Abarca's life and human rights more generally on, on the part of the embassy. So thank you for letting us know um, where the case is at. Um, and also for your role in, in, uh, in helping to bring justice uh, to the Mariano Abarca family um, and, uh, and his community. So our next speaker is uh, Kitty Nivyabandi. Is Kitty Nivyabandi. Um, Kitty is the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada's English section. She's the primary spokesperson for the branch and holds uh, responsibility for the development and delivery of Amnesty International's human rights work in Canada. A global human rights activist and advocate, Ketty holds in-depth and lived experience uh, expertise on refugee issues and the intersections of gender, race, democracy, and human rights. Welcome, Ketty. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Bianca. Yes, we can. Great. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Bianca, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I am joining you from... Um, and uh, okay, it looks like you can see me now. I'm joining you from uh, unceded Algonquin uh, and Anishinaabe territory, and I'm very happy to share Amnesty International's uh, position and our decision to become an intervener uh, in this case. So um, you have heard, uh, obviously, uh, the details of this case. You've heard the facts about Mariano's murder. Uh, the severe damages caused by Blackfire to his community, which he courageously uh, exposed, the following threats and arrests that he endured, and um, the startling inaction of the Canadian Embassy to protect him. This is a narrative that has become very familiar to us over the last two decades as Amnesty has monitored uh, Canadian resource extraction in the region in the Americas. Human rights defenders who protest social and environmental harms of Canadian mining companies are assassinated, they're criminalized, jailed, or seriously harmed in the midst of their standing up for their human rights. 
as you were saying earlier, Bianca, it is certainly a pattern. It is a trend and it's only worsening. So 2020, for instance, was the deadliest year on record for human rights defenders with 264 killings, the majority of whom are environmental and climate justice defenders. Um, so let, let me talk to you a little bit about Canada's international human rights obligations. Um, because that is sort of the nexus of our, our position. The International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, ICCPR, codifies human rights uh, as they are enshrined in the Universal Declaration. And Canada is a party to the ICCPR. It ratified it in 1976. Uh, now, the UN Human Rights Committee, which is the treaty body tasked with monitoring compliance with the uh, ICCPR, uh, explains in its general comment 36, um, and I quote, that corporate entities operating outside of national territories are subject to the jurisdiction of their territories, and that state parties must take account of related international standards of corporate responsibility and the right of victims to obtain effective remedy. It also notes that uh, human rights defenders are at significant risk of harm, especially when they resist transnational business projects. So Canada has ratified several other human rights treaties, um, which makes their contents binding uh, on Canada. So states really have an obligation to create an environment where rights can be fulfilled and their agents should encourage businesses whose conduct they are in a position to influence to ensure that they don't undermine efforts to realize human rights. In this case, the case we're discussing today, embassy officials in Mexico should have used their influence with Blackfire precisely to ensure the company and its employees were respecting the human rights of activists opposed to the mine. Closer to home, the Supreme Court um, of Canada in its uh, recent decision on the case of, uh, against Nefson over allegations of torture and crimes against humanity at its um, Eritrean copper mine uh, noted that international human rights are not, and I quote, theoretical aspirations or legal luxuries, but more imperatives and legal necessities. In other words, Canada doesn't get a free pass from international law when human rights violations happen outside of its borders. In fact, it must protect rights, regardless of whether or not these violations occur within its territorial boundaries. This also means that Canada is called on to prevent private actors, such as companies headquartered and regulated in Canada, from violating human rights. Human rights due diligence, uh, regulation, monitoring of the activities of um, Canadian companies overseas are meant to ensure that business activities do not infringe on human rights. But as we know, unfortunately, in many cases, business activities do in fact infringe and abuse human rights. A cornerstone of international human rights is the right to effective remedy. And this is the basis of our intervention in this case. And I would, I would say revolves around five main points. First, Canada is obligated to provide victims of serious human rights violations with effective remedy. This is a binding international obligation, both as a matter of conventional and customary law. Second, as a rule of customary international law, Canada's duty to conduct an investigation is incorporated into the common law of Canada. Third, one component of the right to an effective remedy for violations of the right to life is the right to an, investi an effective investigation. Fourth, one way in which Canada is able to discharge its duty to investigate is through the commissioner. Um, particularly for matters failing under um, the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act. And then lastly, Canada's international obligation to provide an investigation is a factor that can restrict the exercise of the commissioner's discretion. So effective remedy means that victims receive adequate reparations for the human rights violations they have experienced. And states are duty bound to protect and realize this right for all persons within their jurisdiction, regardless of whether the perpetrator 
um, and these rules are binding uh, on Canada, as I mentioned earlier. So Canada cannot support the economic interests of companies at the expense of international human rights. This is a key point. And where human rights have been violated, victims have the right to an effective remedy. To get to that point, an investigation is required. Um, so why is this case so important? When a human rights defender is at the heart of the matter, failure to conduct um, an effective investigation can give rise to a culture of impunity in which human rights defenders are made even more vulnerable. And that is the case in the Americas. So are their communities and their families who are here with us today and fellow defenders. So it sends a message to non-state actors such as companies that they won't be investigated or punished for human rights abuses. And far too often, this is the exact message that companies who are accused of human rights harms receive. No one will come after you. Canada has a duty to investigate with due diligence, with timeliness, competence, um, impartiality, transparency, in a way that exhausts all possibilities and recognizes a meaningful role of the uh, for the victims in in this case Mariano's family this is not something that Canada can wiggle out of uh, and in our factum to the federal court we note that there are remedies that are available under the public servants disclosure and protection act which would allow Canada to meet its international obligations in this regard it could order an investigation to fulfill in part its obligation to provide an effective remedy uh, under the Act, this would also mean that the findings will be reported to Parliament and to the responsible chief uh, executive within the public service and include recommendations. And of course, investigating, reporting, making recommendations are obviously essential to ensure public accountability and to prevent wrongdoing from reoccurring. It would also encourage consular officials who find themselves in a similar position to do better. So it's precedent setting. In this case, the question at the heart um, of an investigation would be whether Canadian public servants, through acts or failures to act, created or contributed to the danger that Mariano faced. In other words, if the embassy had acted any differently, might Mariano's life have been spared? This is the crucial question that should haunt us all. And yes, the commissioner certainly enjoys broad discretion, uh, discretion to refuse to investigate. However, our view is that the commissioner must consider that Canada is under international human rights obligations to provide victims with effective remedy, which includes an investigation, regardless of its outcome. So any decision to deny an investigation denies the Abarca family the right to an effective remedy. And Canadians have the right to know and to assess whether Canada stands by its international uh, and charter obligations and its values, including its commitment to the Canadian values of democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and environmental stewardship, as it states. So this is a matter of public interest to Canadians and indeed to the international community. And it is our hope that um, Amnesty's joint intervention on the right to remedy sways the courts to uphold the right for effective remedy for Mariano's family, who are also victims, who are robbed of a father, of a husband, of a cherished family and community member, and they deserve justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ketty, um, for your intervention, for drawing attention to the escalating violence and the culture of impunity, um, you know, the need for Canada to comply with international law. You know, you really critically underscored Canada's human rights obligations um, and the need to simply fulfill them. Um, and uh, and I, I think we can all see from your remarks the international importance of this case. So. Thank you. I think our audience has learned a lot about the concept of effective remedy uh, and its relationship to the ways in which Mariano's life uh, may have been spared. So I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. Our next speaker uh, today is Penelope Simons, who is an associate professor and vice dean of uh, research at the Faculty of Law. 
um, and the Gordon F. Henderson Chair in Human Rights at the Human Rights Research and Education Center. She's also on the advisory board of CLA uh, IHR, Canadian Lawyers for Human Rights, a global leader in the field of business and human rights. Her research is focused on issues including the human rights implications of domestic and transnational extractive sector activity, state responsibility for corporate complicity in humans, human rights violations, the regulation of transnational corporations, gender and resource extraction, as well as the intersections between transnational corporate activity, human rights, and international economic law. Welcome, Penelope. Thank you very much, Bianca. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm saying hello from an unceded Algonquin territory. Um, I want to thank you also for this invitation to speak at this very important event. And I'd like to build a little bit on some of Ketty's remarks about Canada's international human rights obligations and, and look at its obligations with respect to its embassies and its mining companies that are operating abroad. So, as Kenny mentioned, Canada's international human rights obligations don't stop at the Canadian border. And if you look closely at international human rights law and also the rules of state responsibility, which is, a little, is about state liability in international law, it suggests that home states like Canada have international obligations to respect human rights and to regulate the transnational activities of of their corporate nationals. And if they fa fail to do that, then that gives rise to what we call state responsibility. So what are can Canada's obligations with respect to its organs and crown corporations that support Canadian companies operating abroad? I'm gonna look a little bit at that. And what are Canada's obligations with respect to its corporations that operate abroad? I'll look at that as well. So first of all, uh, embassies are organs of the Canadian state. They therefore have international human rights obligations. So Canada's international human rights obligations follow its embassies. So when uh, trade commissioner services, for example, support corporate activity abroad, um, you know, such as providing, uh, creating government missions or facilitating partnerships between host states and their corporate nationals, or provide key market intelligence, or they maintain a presence in the host state, um, when they do that uh, and they violate human rights, then they can be uh, held internationally responsible. The second thing is that states can also be held internationally responsible where organs or crown corporations like Export Development Canada, organs like embassies, aid and assist in the commission of an internationally wrongful act by another state or that has been committed by a corporation. And in order for this to happen, the internationally wrongful act and the act would have to be internationally wrongful if it was committed by that state. So for example, if Canada knowingly aided and assisted Mexico in violations of human rights um, that were in relation to corporate activity, it could be held internationally responsible. Canada could also incur international responsibility for complicity in acts of corporations themselves where those acts individuals have obligations under international law not to commit international crimes or to commit violations of what we call peremptory norms. So these are high level rules of customary international law, such as the prohibition against torture, the prohibition against slavery, things like that. Um, and a, a country, a state like Canada could incur international responsibility for violations of human rights that amount to international crimes, where they aid or assist a corporate actor in the commission of those acts. Uh, so an example would be if Export Development Canada, uh, Canada's export credit agency, provides a loan or investment guarantees or political risk insurance to a corporation that then uh, engages in grave violations of human rights that amount to international crimes. Um, Canada could include Canada knew that it was aiding and assisting in a wrong 
Impactful Act. Uh, and you can assume that it would have constructive knowledge of this if we're talking about Export Development Canada, because Export Development Canada, for example, says that it takes human rights and other social impacts into account in all, all right so that's that's the embassies uh, and the and the uh, crown corporations what about canada's obligations to regulate corporations now Ketty talked a little bit about this but i want to build on this because she was mainly focusing on the right to an effective remedy but under international law states have a general duty not to act in a way within their territory that's going to cause harm outside of their territory and so this general duty obliges states uh, that know that the acts of its nationals will cause or are causing harm to other states or people within those states and where it can control that activity to take steps to prevent that harm. So there's a case uh, that went before the International Court of Justice uh, on the application of the genocide convention between Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia and Montenegro in which the court held that um, there's a duty under the Genocide Convention to prevent genocide. Uh, and there was an obligation, therefore, on the part of uh, the former Republic of Yugoslavia to take steps to prevent the massacre uh, that was perpetrated in Srebrenica. And the uh, former Republic of Yugoslavia had a deep knowledge of the potential for uh, the Bosnian Serb group, the VRS, to commit that genocide, and it also had an undeniable influence over that group. Now, in terms of corporations, uh, and sort of uh, looking at this from the perspective of, of Canada and, its company and, and companies that are operating abroad, you can't reasonably argue today that the Canadian government is unaware that Canadian companies might engage in activities that violate human rights in other countries, or that Canada doesn't have the capacity to regulate or control the acts of its companies when they're operating abroad. So this general duty that exists in international law is also consistent with international human rights law. And we see this in the position of United Nations treaty bodies, um, which talk about this duty that Ketty mentioned um, to take legislative and other measures to regulate transnational activity of corporations that are located within their territory, so Canadian corporations, but where that activity might have effects um, that violate human rights in other countries. So Ketty also mentioned um, uh, General Comment 36 of the Human Rights Committee, and this is the body that oversees uh, the state compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it, General Kama uh, says, first of all, that states have a duty to protect the right to life, and they have to take reasonable positive measure, measures in response to reasonably foreseeable threats to life that originate from private persons and entities, so corporations. And they have to take appropriate legislative and other measures to ensure that activities that take place in Canada, uh, in part or in whole, um, but then have a reasonably foreseeable direct impact on the right to life of individuals in other countries, um, they have to regulate those activities. So they have this obligation to protect the right to life and they have to regulate corporations uh, uh, that may violate human rights in other countries where they're located in Canada. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the committee that oversees this, uh, there's also another general comment that was issued in 2017 that talks about this duty and it says that states have a positive duty to adopt a legal framework requiring business entities to exercise human rights due diligence in order to identify, prevent and mitigate the risks of violations of the rights that are protected under the International Covenant. Uh, to avoid those rights being abused and to account for negative impacts that are caused or contributed to this by their decisions and operations of the entities that they control and also of entities within their supply chain. So that's a very, uh, very broad obligation that, that, that the uh, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is talking about. Now, UN human rights treaty bodies, the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Committee on 
the elimination of racial discrimination, the Committee on the Discrimination Against Women have all called on Canada to regulate uh, its extractive corporations when they're operating abroad uh, and to do other things like establish an effective non-judicial complaint mechanism and remove the barriers to um, suits that are being brought in Canadian courts. The International, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has also called on Canada to strengthen its rules and mechanisms to secure better human rights practices of their corporate citizens abroad. Now, if we look globally, we can see that Canada is lagging behind its peers. There are countries in Europe like France, Germany, and Switzerland that are introducing laws that mandate corporations when they're operating uh, overseas to engage in human rights due diligence. So preventive uh, measures to ensure that they do not have an impact on human rights. And if they do, to take steps to uh, redress that impact. But Canada has continued to use a policy approach to regulation. And Karis was talking about uh, Canada's CSR policy uh, and the very vague provisions that are in that CSR policy. That CSR policy does not even meet the prescriptions that are set out in the non-binding United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And it's really important to note that this is not simply a reputational issue. It's, it's a legal issue and the willful failure of Canada to comply with its human rights obligations has significant, and as we've seen in this case, sometimes deadly consequences for individuals and communities that are affected by the resource extraction conducted by Canadian companies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Penelope. Thank you for, um, for just drawing our attention to um, our international obligations um, and for bringing your incredible uh, expertise to, to the table. Um, we are now drawing very close uh, towards uh, the end of our time here. Um, we have one final speaker of the evening, um, David Yazbek from the Center for Freedom of Expression at Ryerson University. He's an experienced and passionate lawyer who practices labor, employment, and human rights law. He's a leading advocate for whistleblowers where he has developed significant expertise on this area. Um, just a quick note to the audience regarding the Q&A that uh, David wears two hats in this context. Um, he's both an advocate for whistleblowers as well as counsel for the intervener. So as such, um, he, he has to exercise caution when answering questions uh, given his role as counsel in a matter which has yet to be decided by the court. Welcome, David. Thank you so much, uh, Bianca. And I'm just waiting for, there we go. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. My name is David Yazbek. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa. Uh, I am on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. I'm really cognizant of the time, so I will try to be focused uh, here in terms of the position that the CFE or the Center for Free Expression is taking. Uh, the CFE, is a, just so you know, is a nonpartisan research, public education, and advocacy center based at the Faculty of Communi Communication and Design at Ryerson. It um, has a, an interest in a variety of aspects of free expression, and that includes whistleblower protection. Uh, of course, whenever a whistleblower uh, discloses wrongdoing, they are engaging in freedom of expression, and it's imperative that uh, we ensure that the processes that one can engage in as a whistleblower are effective, um, that they actually give one an opportunity to speak, and also that they protect them in the event of reprisal, which is an inevitable consequence of um, disclosing wrongdoing. So uh, I'm, I'm external counsel, but I have been retained by the Center for Free Expression to uh, take a position here as an intervener. And our position is, I, I guess, is consistent with the other positions you've heard about, but also uh, it's, it's broader in the sense that we are urging a broad purposive uh, interpretation of the legislation. 
Um, one of the things that we stress, and this is, I think, important for the audience to recognize, is that the Act, the Public Service Disclosure Protection Act, in itself uh, recognizes the significance uh, of the Act. It has a preamble uh, which describes that, and, and those of us who, who are familiar with law know that the preamble is not binding, but it does give you a flavor of what the legislation is about, what it's intended to achieve. And in this case, the preamble to the Act recognizes that the federal public administration is an important national institution, and it is part of the essential framework of Canadian parliamentary democracy. Uh, it recognizes that it's in the public interest to maintain and enhance public confidence in the integrity of public servants. And it's also um, important to ensure that there's confidence in public institutions by enhancing effective procedures for the disclosure of wrongdoings and protecting people who disclose wrongdoings, particularly public servants. And I guess uh, I'd, I'd ask the audience a question right now, given all that you've heard, uh, do you think that the act is op operating in the way that parliament intended? Uh, and certainly it's my respectful position that that's not the case. Um, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a somewhat unique situation insofar as the disclosure of wrongdoing in this case is not from inside the public service. And as Nicholas already pointed out, uh, the, the language on this issue is, is, is specific. And the question is whether or not the commissioner had a reason to believe wrongdoing had been committed. That is a reason to believe that there was something wrong done within the embassy or by embassy staff or representatives of the Canadian government as, uh, as Nicholas described earlier. So reason to believe, what does that mean? And one of the things that we are arguing before the Court of Appeal now is that that's a very low standard, it's a minimal standard. Um, particularly when you're dealing with somebody who is outside of the public service. Oftentimes the whistleblowers I represent come from within, so they have access to information, they may have disclosure of information or documents that they've seen that are highly relevant to wrongdoing. In other words, they're on the inside. Um, here, uh, the disclosure, because it's coming from the outside, you don't have as much of an opportunity, you don't even have the strength or the power to obtain information that might be relevant. Uh, in fact, that's the whole point of conducting an investigation, the commissioner's office conducting an investigation, is to find that evidence. And, and not necessarily to find in the disclosures a favor, but to look at it uh, objectively and decide is there wrongdoing here. So reasonable to, reason to believe is, is a low standard because coming from the outside, um, you, you just can't, you just can't offer the same kind of proof that someone else might have uh, in another circumstance. Um, so in that context, what we do as well is we borrow heavily on uh, uh, from case law involving human rights litigation. And I do a fair bit of human rights litigation as well. And the reality is that it's very difficult to prove, for example, discrimination uh, in the federal public service. You have to rely on systemic evidence sometimes. You have to re rely on uh, circumstantial evidence. You have to draw lines between pieces of evidence, et cetera, make inferences. Uh, and forgive me, interpreters, I just realized I'm speaking much, much too fast. Um, so the point is that uh, it, 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 it's the, the nature of this kind of wrongdoing is difficult to prove. And so at this stage, uh, the member of the public should not have too high of a bar uh, to, in order to demonstrate that uh, the commissioner's office should conduct an investigation. And so we uh, support the, uh, the counsel for, for the appellants in this case, uh, simply because uh, the interpretation that's been adopted in our submission is um, makes it too difficult for people to uh, disclose wrongdoing in these circumstances. And more broadly speaking, my experience dealing with this legislation, and now I'm not speaking as counsel for the uh, CFE, but just as, as an advocate in this area, um, we've had our struggles with how this act has been interpreted, interpreted and applied. Uh, there is a wide view out there that it's not always interpreted in the broadest way, that uh, sometimes it feels like the commissioner's office is trying to avoid investigations into difficult matters. Um, whether or not that's the case here is beside the point, but the, po the point is that uh, it's really important to have the court intervene in a case like this in order to send a message to the commissioner's office that uh, these are very significant issues that you are uh, asked to investigate. And 
I don't have to repeat that the issues in this case are extremely significant. They uh, are a question of life and death uh, for a variety of people, um, including Mr. Barca. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, we're hopeful that our intervention and support of the appellants will uh, will help. And um, we'll switch into a question and answer session here, I think. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, David, for your intervention. Thanks for illuminating our audience to the intricacies of, uh, of human rights legislation and the importance of court interventions in cases like these. So um, we have very little time left. In fact, we are over time. I'm gonna give a little bit of time for some final um, questions and answers just because uh, quite a few have come in, but we're gonna keep uh, this session uh, Q&A session very short. I'm going to try and keep it to uh, to about 10 minutes uh, maximum for whoever is able to stay on. Um, so I'm just going to go really quickly into that. And the first question that we have is for uh, Nicholas Pope. Um, the question is a Canadian NGO delegation that went to Chico Mosello in 2010 to investigate the murder of Mariano Abarca also met with the Canadian embassy in Mexico City. Um, our main meeting took place with the embassy political counselor, Karim Amigan. He revealed that he'd been sent to Chiapas soon after the murder of Mariano and provided a report to the ambassador upon his return, uh, which he wouldn't share with the delegation. If you don't have a copy already, would a copy of this report be helpful for the November 8th hearing at the Federal Court of Appeal? Nicholas? Thanks. Uh, thanks for mentioning that and uh, offering that up. Um, Unfortunately, all the evidence is already sort of set in stone for the appeal. Uh, you can't bring in new evidence later on, but uh, I think we have the sufficient evidence that we need. And primarily this, uh, um, the acts that have to be focused on uh, are the acts that occurred prior to Mariano Barca's death, rather than sort of the subsequent events because of the allegations that certain actions at embassy um, ended up uh, being a greater risk of his death. Thank you, Nicholas. The next question we have is for David. Um, you've done a lot of litigation under um, the whistleblowing legislation. Um, and in this capacity, can you comment about, for example, your experience with people who have disclosed uh, wrongdoings? Yep, yeah, could uh, hear from you briefly on that. Sure, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, it, it's interesting, the, the, the jurisprudence and the sort of social science analysis of this subject matter is far more advanced in the United States because they've, they've had whistleblower legislation on the books for far longer. Um, but there, there usually is a fairly uh, common uh, set of reactions when someone blows the whistle, particularly if they are internal to the organization. Uh, and it's almost like it's unconscious. Um, in some cases, it's not, I believe. But in a lot of cases, it's as if the, the organization has encountered a virus and it just inherent, it inherently starts to attack it. So it's not surprising for people who disclose wrongdoing to all of a sudden be, start being criticized. They have a poor performance appraisal, even though they've done well all their career. Um, I've seen people who are whose offices are being are moved and, and the move is... Uh, not a functional one, it's symbolic. They're moved into a smaller office, uh, et cetera. They're, sometimes they're accused of harassment. They're accused of not being a team player. Uh, a lot of gaslighting goes on with respect to what they, they say is happening in the workplace. There's a very much um, an ethos of trying to attack the messenger. Uh, and those are fairly common uh, responses. It's, 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 I would be shocked, uh, in fact, if, if a whistleblower came into my office and said, I've disclosed wrongdoing, but nothing's happened to me. Um, because it, it almost inevitably results in something. And that's why the other part of the legislation is really important too here, which is the reprisal part, uh, which we're not necessarily engaged in, but it just, it, it demonstrates the, the global concern here that Parliament had. In spite of the flaws in the legislation, the concern is to make sure that people feel comfortable disclosing wrongdoing. And that's important for the functioning of Parliament. Um, thanks, thanks for the question. Thank you, David. Um, the next question we have is for um, Karis or Jen. Uh, some activists in Canada have been calling for a Canadian ombudsperson uh, response for responsible enterprise to have full power to investigate and withdraw public support from Canadian mining companies found to be responsible for significant abuses abroad. 
how far would this go in terms of keeping corporations accountable? And this can, uh, it's directed to Karis and Jen, but uh, anyone else can jump in. Um, thanks for the question. And I invite Jen to also answer. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the um, quick answer being over time is that it really depends on the, how that mechanism is designed. Um, if the investigation isn't effective uh, and if the ombudsperson can't get access to all of the evidence uh, through the capacity to compel the evidence uh, from the company, um, it won't be effective. Uh, if the ombudsperson doesn't have the power to order sanctions uh, and if there isn't an enforcement mechanism for those sanctions, it won't be effective. So. Uh, there are quite a few features of an ombudsperson that would be necessary for it to, to be effective in terms of preventing and also remedying human rights abuses. And unfortunately, we haven't seen those features um, in the current, uh, the current um, proposal or the current um, uh, body that the government of Canada has, uh, has uh, put forward. So that's the quick answer, hopefully. Thank you, Karis. So um, the last, I think we only have time for one more question and it's a fairly general one and it's for all panelists. So um, please uh, feel free to answer um, any, any one of you and, and more than one if you like. Why do you think this case is so important? I can go if no one else is. Uh, yeah, I'll go yeah, after you, please. Yes, um, uh, I'll go. There are several reasons, and I think we've outlined them throughout. You know, throughout the event, which with each made our case. Uh, but, but but I would say that uh, the impact, first of all, is is huge um, overseas. It's clear that Canada has obligations overseas, but the impact is also uh, immense on on. Um, uh, you know, indigenous uh, uh, land defenders or human rights defenders beyond beyond Canada, but the, the potential also of it being a precedent setting and uh, being able to finally, as we've talked about earlier, there are um, voices at risk guidelines that exist. There are all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, of indications from the Canadian government that there is an awareness of this is happening, but the practice hasn't shifted. And I think in this case, there would be a possibility of, of really setting a precedent for accountability and for uh, effective remedy, which has been the most difficult thing to achieve uh, when we talk about Canadian mining corporations abroad. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a, very, um, a very important case, both for on the human rights perspective, but also in terms of setting uh, standards of accountability uh, right here in Canada. Uh, but Penelope, you might want to add something. Thank you, Ketty. Yes, Penelope. I think it's uh, it's it's a really, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I, I think it's a really important case, partly because it's one of the first cases that's really a, trying to hold the Canadian government accountable as opposed to a corporation. The, you know, all the cases that have been brought through the courts or to the national co contact point under the OECD guidelines or to the CSR counselor, or I guess the core, uh, those are all about corporations themselves. And this is about what, what did the Canadian government do or not do? And, you know, and, and, and is there a way to, to hold the government accountable in that regard? Thank you, Penelope. David. Yes, just quickly, uh, as I indicated, this, this case involves the standard that the commissioner's office will apply to disclosures of wrongdoing that start or, or uh, come from outside the public service. And anytime the court gets an opportunity to clarify the role of the commissioner, uh, the standards that the commissioner must comply with in order to ensure that the purpose of the act is respected is a great opportunity. So th this, this is a very good case for doing that. And unfortunately, over the last while, number of years, we've had to litigate a lot, a lot of these cases, but um, we're hopeful that in this case, we'll at least get some clarification on the law around what circumstances uh, would, would require the commissioner to at least start an investigation in these cases. 
Thank you, David. And I think that is, um, is a great note on which to uh, end um, our q and A. I I just want to send a huge thank you to our uh, presenters today. Um, uh, also a special thanks to our interpreters, um, Marta Singh and Michael Cardi. Um, I, again, I want to thank all the groups that have endorsed and supported uh, this discussion um, and that will join us in carrying it forward. It's a very long list. Um, and so we'll post that in the chat again. And remember, if you're not already plugged in, you can keep yourselves informed um, and perhaps more importantly, engage um, in more discussions on these topics um, by connecting with these great, great organizations, um, following the work of the speakers, um, you know, and finding out which of these orgs are closest to you or closest to your own focus. Um, and please do carry on with this learning process. Um, we, we really do need to continue the work of building a better future where we no longer see this kind of uh, impunity for human rights abuses. Um, so finally, since the 10th anniversary of the murder of uh, Mariano Abarca in November, 2019, the Abarca family uh, together with Otros Mundos Chiapas Remo, Mining Watch Canada and, and uh, many other Mexican and international supporters have given out the Mariano Abarca Environmental Defense Award um, to a community collective or organization in Chiapas. And this is the third year that that award will be given out uh, in memory of Mariano on November 27th. So the award winner will soon be announced. Um, so to learn more about that award and um, to get uh, updates about the case that's before the Federal Court of Appeals, um, uh, you, we got the uh, incredible timing for today's uh, discussion. We got the hearing date. Um, and so, you know, please check out the follow-up email for this event um, that you'll receiving, be receiving shortly about what steps you can take to demand justice for Mariano um, and how you can show solidarity. Um, so um, I just want to say for further updates, you can also sign up to Mining Watch's list um, for updates on the case. And in the meantime, um, you can also do things like tweet about the event to demand justice for Mariano using the hashtags, hashtag justice for Mariano in English and hashtag justice, uh, justicia para Mariano uh, in Spanish. So again, for those of us living in Canada, uh, it's important that we educate ourselves and our communities on the sheer scope of human rights and environmental abuses um, that we've heard about today that Canadian mineral projects have wrought across the globe. Um, thanks again to all the panelists for so generously sharing um, your time with us and your expertise. It's been a tremendous evening. Um, such an incredible group uh, of, of experts. Um, thank you to um, the family member, um, family members for being here. Jose Luis, thank you to our audience for tuning in and, uh, and for your great questions and participation. So with that, we're gonna conclude today's event. It's been terrific. Um, goodbye to everybody at home and to our panelists. And that's it for today's program. Thank you and thank goodbye. You.